Sahana Vavatu Sahano Bunaktu Sahavir Yankarawa Wahe Tejasvina Vadhi Tamastu Ma Vidvisha Wahe Om Shanti 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 May we be nurtured together. May we be nourished together. May we strive together. May our learning shine. May we not quarrel. Here's the questions that I haven't answered yet. Starting with Mina. Microcosm, macrocosm relationship with the causal body. The jiva goes there during the sleep. How does this work? And then she also asked about Hiranya Garbha. What is it? Pavan asked, if you can explain the origin of the material, then it solves the problem. We already talked about the material and the intelligent cause being from uh, one and the same Prakriti. And then he said, is there a gap between Brahman and desire to create? Atabahusyam. Remember when we use this chart and I, this 24 model of creation, the important, which I'm going to hopefully use today. And then I said, Mahat, um, and I said, let me become many. Atabahusyam. So what um, Pavan is asking is, is there a space or a gap between Brahman and desire to create? No, because what does a gap imply? Time. So this means in that case, then Brahman was in time. And then suddenly Brahman thought, or in Brahman, there was this time concept that says, let's create. So this means the moment you introduce this beginning, you're immediately bringing the problem of time. And also I'm going to um, cover this Atabahu Siam because you're probably going to ask, how did the limitless one have a desire to create? If one is limitless and nothing is missing, then where's the question of let me become many? Where does this desire come from? Why would he create many? Why would he have a desire? So I'm going to talk about that. Uh, Robert uh, asked the question, Ishwara is an uncaused cause. There's a strict difference between Ishwara and Brahman. So it's not that Ishwara is an uncaused cause. Brahman is an uncaused cause. Ishwara is still caused, it's still mitya in respect to Brahman. Now what happens is sometimes we mix up the words Ishwara and we actually mean Brahman. But you cannot say that Ishwara is an uncaused cause because it still depends on awareness. That means there's no knowledge unless there's a conscious being giving, illumining that knowledge. Would Brahman know itself without the projected world? Yes, he knows himself. Why? Because Brahman is Sat Chit Ananda, limitless awareness of himself as himself as limitless awareness. In other words, Brahman doesn't need the world for uh, someone to confirm, yes, you know, this is, I am conscious and this consciousness is Brahman. Brahman doesn't need you to know himself. In some spiritual traditions, they say that God created what he was not in order to know himself. Because without a subject-object relationship, there can't be knowledge. So in the Kabbalistic tradition, it's called the Zinzon. Uh, in some of the esoteric spiritual traditions, I also talk about creating that projected world wherein God may know himself by seeing his reflection. This is different than what Abayda is saying, yeah? Yeah, see, the problem is if God created himself to know himself, then that means God is, li is limited. Actually, I'm going to talk about this today. What's the logical fallacy if you say that um, he wanted to create for any reason whatsoever? And then Lorena's question was, I don't buy into Big Bang uh, because Brahman is beginningless and the Big Bang suggests a beginning. So let's begin with asking, why creation? It's a common question, right? Why all this? What's the purpose of creation? Why was why did creation come in the first place? What was the cause for it? What was the reason for this world coming into being? What's the reason for these names and forms? Why not limitless just stay limitless without having to create the world? And also, what is your and my role as human beings in this world? So let's start with this question. Firstly, creation is a cyclical one. What does cyclical mean? It means it goes through a cycle of creation, sustenance, 
and then resolution. And then again, creation, sustenance, dissolution. dissolution. There's no such thing as first time creation, and then it sustained, and then it dissolves, and that is it. In other words, just like your dream, it goes through the process of comes out of you, it goes into you. It comes out of you, it goes into you. And when it's not coming out, is it out of existence? No, it is still in the one being, the one limitless being from the standpoint of Ishwara. So it's not like the world went anyway, it just resolved itself into what we call the uh, Prakriti, according to what we did in the 24 chart, Prakriti here, which I said, the unmanifest potential, Maya. So in other words, what I mean to say is creation. When I say creation, what I'm talking about is the manifest universe. Creation never had one specific beginning. This is important to understand because the moment you want to introduce a beginning, like the first time ever, then you can go into many logical problems. In other words, there was no such thing as creation suddenly popped into existence. In other words, it wasn't there before anywhere in existence and suddenly it popped into existence out of nowhere. Because then you have to ask, then what did it pop out? From where did it come from? Existence number two? Okay, then what is existence number two? The moment you introduce existence number two, you have a problem of space because now you have to accommodate existence number one and existence number two. Now, which one's real? Is existence one real, existence two real, or is space existence real? In other words, you go into a logical fallacy the moment you introduce two-ness into the picture. So there was never a time when creation was not. There was never a time when this was not. When I say this, I'm talking about this world. The world always was undergoing through the stages of creation, sustenance, resolution. And this is just one single cycle amongst trillions and trillions and trillions of cycles for trillions and trillions of years that have already gone by. We are just finding ourselves in one. And here you are and I again in one creation, alive inside, wearing this four koshas. Hello again. In other words, you and I have been walking the earth and many worlds for trillions and trillions of years nothing new think about it this way you have already been a king a queen a mom a dad you have been a sinner a saint you have been a singer a dancer a technician an engineer an archaeologist you have been every combination imaginable because you've already been in the form of this body jiva for trillions and trillions of incarnations why because i just explained creation is cyclical Creation, sustenance, resolution. So on the basis of understanding this, you really start to change your perception about being alive. It's like, what is my real purpose for being here? Is it just to play back one more combination of what I've already done before trillions and trillions of times? Or is it something much more important? And the Vedas are very clear. The Vedas, this is what the Vedas brings out. They say this. Yes, you can go through trillions and trillions of combinations of artha, dharma and karma but hey there's one more goal there and that goal is to get you out of this constant cycle of creation sustenance dissolution and therefore then the person starts to pursue this process of moksha beginningless manifest beginningless unmanifest just like a seed seed gives birth to a tree the tree gives birth to a seed that seed falls down, gives birth to another tree. That tree grows up, another seed. Now, which one was first? Was it the tree or the seed? To ask, why is there creation? Implies what? A beginning in time. In other words, at some point, someone created creation. Someone thought, you know, I'm limitless, right? And nothing's missing in me. But something's missing. I have, nevertheless, I don't know how that makes sense. But anyway, no, let me call up my friend, existence number two, and goes, um, existence number two, um, I've kind of been limitless for a limitless amount of years. 
um, fill me up. I need something more. And then someone says, no problem. Just go and just go and create, create another world. Oh, I never thought of that. In other words, limitlessness, the one that lacks nothing needed an, an idea to create the universe, all knowledge, all power lacked in a half thought in order to create the universe. Where is sense in that kind of thinking? And therefore, then limitlessness thought, okay, now that I've gotten this idea, even though I'm all knowledge, all power, and nothing is missing in me, now let me go and create this world. And then you ask, why did this world come? Do you see the logical problem? If you, if you think like this, why did the world come? Why is there creation in the first place? Because then you're attributing time. To attribute time, then you have to now ask, what being was there who lacked something which at, for some reason decided to create the universe? So this means that being, whoever that being is, is now limited. In other words, they're, they're feeling incomplete. And out of their incompleteness, they created the jiva. And then they created, you know, they're now eating divine popcorn, right? And enjoying jivas kind of swimming through the ocean of samsara, trying to kind of, you know, dive through this uh, process of spirituality and get themselves out of this creation. And this guy up there is sitting just going, mm, you know, these people are suffering. This is so cool. Give me more popcorn. Give me more divine Coca-Cola, right? So it doesn't work like this. So this, what I'm showing you so far is the problem. The moment you ask, why is there creation? Then it's, it's coming out of a logic that is not yet ascertained. The principle that creation was never a beginning. It was a beginningless beginning. Now, if limitless one lacked an insight to create, that means he's not limitless, number one. That means he cannot be Satchit Ananda. Problem number two, from what other existence did he borrow the idea of creating this, this creation? Problem number three, because there's another existence, it introduces the problem of space because you can only have two in space. Problem number four, who created space now to accommodate the two existences? Problem number five, which one's most superior now out of the three? Existence one, existence two, or space? Problem number, whatever number it is, which one should I devote to? Should I devote to space as the final reality? Should I devote to existence one, that is Ishwara, or should I devote to some other Ishwara that you and I have no access to? In other words, you can keep on going with the amount of logical problems when we introduce the, the principle of a creation that has a beginning. However, we can ask, what is the purpose of the present cycle of creation? See the difference? It's the same question. I didn't change the question. I only said, what is the purpose of creation in respect to the present cycle? Now we can have a proper discussion. So this means I've first clarified that one question can mean two things. I've eliminated possibility number one. I'm bringing possibility number two, where there is a probable answer. So let's first ask, what is the unmanifest state of the universe? What is this unmanifest state, this state that we call macrocosmic disillusion? What is this state whereby there's no universe at all? There's nothing, there's no elements, nothing. In other words, what is this state all the way before the Big Bang, right? Once it's still in the process of Panchikarana, the, you know, the five gross elements, and then right before the five gross elements, what is that unmanifest state? That is a state whereby the jiva, that means every living being, and also the object, is in a potential unmanifest state. In other words, a causal state. What is a causal state? That means it is a state that causes the universe. We said, Prakriti, Avyakta, cause of everything, or Maya, the unmanifest potential, or Karana Sharira, the causal body. So what is the unmanifest state? It is whereby every jiva and every object is resolved in this Prakriti, in the causal unmanifest potential state. For example, when you sleep, you are in unmanifest state. You're in a causal state. It doesn't mean you're out of existence, but just in a potential. And upon waking, what happens? 
this causal state, this potential, then manifests into the waking state. And then your life starts all over again. In fact, it just continues. It doesn't start all over again. It just continues. In that same way, creation, sustenance, disillusion. You just, the, the entire universe just continues as though having a long sleep. Everything that's been done, everything that's been said, just continues and keeps on going. In other words, just like you, the microcosmic individual, go to sleep, so does the entire universe go through a process of disillusion. It's called the Brahmaji night, one night of sleep. Does someone want to say something? Yes, uh, Andrea. So um, uh, one day of uh, one day is like uh, universe is existing, right? What is happening during that night? Like that's a time taken to uh, for, like some kind of destruction is happening at that time. Or, or what is happening? What happens during the resolution when there is no universe? It just resolves into the causal body. It's in a potential state. From the standpoint of creation, there's no world. Yeah. So everything resolves. Every jiva, every object is resolved in a in a causal state. So it does not happen in an instant. The, the dissolution is not an instantaneous activity. It, it, it cannot be instantaneous. Everything okay. is, is slow. It goes through a process of evolution. And just like you go through a sleep every single night, just like that, that's called a microcosmic dissolution. So in other words, every night you have a microcosmic dissolution. In that same way, the universe goes through a macrocosmic dissolution. So this means we all go through a really long sleep. So there's no difference between the sleep that you have at night and the sleep of the entire universe where everything dissolves because it dissolves where into the same causal body so when you sleep what is where is where is this jiva where is the subtle body resolve into the causal body we've talked about prakriti during the entire macrocosmic dissolution where does the whole universe go into into the same prakriti so what's the experience during the prakriti the same experience as that you have during every single night and what is that experience? The identity whereby you and I are identified during the causal body, what is that? I know nothing. I am totally, absolutely ignorant. That's everyone's experience during sleep, is it not? So what does this prove? It proves that every single individual goes to the same place during sleep. A king is no more or less than a farmer or an ant. You are an ant during sleep, and an ant is you. In other words, there's no difference because both are in potential state. There's no identity. There's only when the person comes out, then what happens? All of, all of the assignments for this specific person come, and therefore we go identify with those assignments, and we say, ah, I am a king, and then our personality flourishes into the world. But in deep sleep, the ant's personality, okay, let's not use an ant, let's call it a little dog, you know, a happy dog. A dog resolves into the causal body, but so does the jiva resolve into the causal body. And therefore, there is no jiva and there is no dog during deep sleep. There's just potential. Total ignorance. I know absolutely nothing. Now, why is it total ignorance? Because there's nothing to know. You are in potential. It's not like you're stupid during deep sleep. It just means you are in a state of hibernation. When I say you, I'm talking about the subtle body. The, the I that is identified with the subtle body, that subtle body is now identified with the causal body. So, so far, what did I say? There's no difference between the microcosmic dissolution that we undergo every single night and the macrocosmic dissolution of this entire cre creation that goes through the three cycles of creation, sustenance, and destruction. What specifically caused the unmanifest universe to become the manifest universe so suppose now there's no universe right what specifically caused the big bang the universe to come that's what i'm asking to answer this i'll ask you this what makes you wake up every morning what makes you wake up so without the alarm clock of course there are biological explanations of it yeah, About there is a brain. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sure. There is a biological. So, you know, on the level of the anamaya kosha, there is a different chemical reaction, and there's, you know, your um, you, your brain goes from delta state into a theta state, and then you can observe that also with the brain. Yeah. But what else causes you? The answer is our pranapta. Our pranapta. The desire to be. Good. Okay. Good. Pranapta karma slash 
desires. So the question was, what causes you and I to wake up every morning without the alarm clock? Natural, and that is our desires. And then what do we do? We wake, do we just kind of wake up and not do anything? What do you do right after you wake up? You get up and you do stuff. What does that imply? I have things to do. You know, and what are those things that you do? Is it from yesterday? Absolutely. In other words, you do things that are continuation from yesterday. So this means all of those desires were resolved. There was a microcosmic resolution and it went nowhere except the causal body. Upon waking, when those desires stirred up, then it caused this individual that was resolved in the, in the, in the causal body to then to manifest into the waking. And therefore this individual just simply continues the life that was already there yesterday. This is what every individual undergoes this process. And then you times this through all cycles of creation. So the, the answer was our desires wake us up. In that same way, what causes this universe to be woken up into a new cycle of creation? The macrocosmic desires of all individuals, of all living beings. So why is this present creation the way that it is? Why is this universe the way that it is? Karma. In other words, it's a result of the total desires of every single being spread throughout this universe in all 14 lokas, according to the Vedas, or the multi-universes, if you want to use the scientific model, which they're only using simulations, they haven't really proven, but it kind of goes in hand with the Vedas. Um. Desires of the jivas from the previous cycle, is that causing the universe of this? Good. So in other words, this universe is a reflection of the desires that are simply being carried over from the previous cycle of creation. So you want to ask, what was the previous creation like? Exactly like this one. Obviously, there were some differences because, you know, our desires changed, the universe changed throughout, the jivas' desires changed throughout the beings, the prarapta karma is changing, and therefore the universe is changing right along with the jivas. Why is this creation the way that it is? It's a result of the total amount of desires that are manifesting for all jivas. So it's almost as if all jivas were sleeping in the unmanifest mode. And then suddenly they all collectively decided, now it's time to fulfill our desires. It's time to express our desires. Maybe um, Mina was like, you know, I want to kind of have some ice cream. It's time to wake up boys and girls. And then the rest of us were like, no, no, we want to sleep a little bit more. It's so cozy in here. And then we waited a few more couple of trillions of years. And then finally, we all agreed to uh, have another chance at expressing our desires. And for that, you need what? For that, you need creation. For that, you need the world. In other words, what is this creation? It is a response of the total amount of desires that the jiva needs. Therefore, for that reason alone, creation comes. Why? Because it needs to provide you an appropriate field, an appropriate world, so that you and I can express our desires. You can't just have a desire and just keep it inside. Is it not true that when you wake up, as I said the question earlier, what do you do? You move, you talk, you go to places. All of that in the name of fulfilling my desires, my prarata karma. So this entire world that we observe is nothing but a reflection of jivas walking around for the sake of fulfilling our desires. So the next world will not be the follow-up from this world, is it? The next creation. Yeah, it always depends because we, we don't know what um, and which which planet specifically, Earth. You know, there's many other planets also with other beings and other uh, jivas all over the universe. So it always depends on what the jivas decide collectively. It's like global warming, you know, once in that inconvenient truth by uh, Al Gore, as someone, one of the students asked him, um, sir, now having showed us the impacts of climate change, what is the projection of our climate in the next 50 years? And Al Gore created a very um, wonderful answer. It's common sense. He said, it all depends on what we collectively do as a result of having seen the information which I presented in my program called The Inconvenient Truth. In that same way, what is the status of this world in the next 100 years? It depends on what we collectively decide to do on the basis of uh, our uh, what's available to us. Robert? The present manifestation begins where the last creation finished. Yeah. Because this is our, the effect of that karma. Yeah. 
I had been taught previously the same thing that when the universe comes out of Pralaya, it begins again at a higher level. So there's an evolutionary aspect to this. Is that correct? It doesn't make sense to say it's an evolutionary aspect. Suppose you're born and you're highly empathetic, so you're carrying a quality of empathy. And suppose now your friends tell you, you know, you're being too empathetic. People are taking advantage of you. And now what do you do? You decide to firm up your resolve. In other words, just by firming up, you start to reduce the amount of empathy that you had or that you have carried over from your previous life. Therefore, you become almost as if a little bit more selfish now. So this also shows us that you can take qualities, highly evolved qualities of compassion and empathy, and through an experience of someone telling you, you're being too naive, you need to firm up your resolve, people taking advantage of you, you say, hmm, you're right. Now having thought about it, it's probably true. So I'm going to not be so empathetic now. And therefore the person through that can degenerate or not even degenerate, but release that quality. So evolution is like a stock market, right? In other words, it goes through an up and down cycle. That means we're sort of a bit like that mouse that's running on a wheel. We're not really getting anywhere, you know? Which means there's no meaning to the endlessly repetitive cycles of life. There's two ways to answer this. See, suppose you just keep on doing the same thing over and over again. Sure, it's not going to get you anywhere. But isn't it also true that you're going to get bored and then move on to something else? And that very act of moving to something else is enough to be another stepping stone to something that is a little bit more meaningful than what I've been doing before. So there's always two ways to look at it. Um, what is the human role in this creation? What is the animal role in this creation? Well, generally it is to eat, preservation, and procreation. Now, can these three basic instincts be also true for a human being? No. Because if it, they were true for every human being, then everyone would be generally happy. We've got lots of food for the most part today. You just give you a banana, you know, you're happy, chappy. Just give you a banana tomorrow, you're happy, chappy. Predictable happiness, just keep on supplying with bananas, right? Um, everyone's got a general roof over their head, especially today, you know, with the big population. And procreation, that's, you know, it's more than available today. In fact, we've got procreation paying services today also. And yet that still doesn't create any sort of long lasting, real, sustainable, authentic joy or happiness in a person's life. So it cannot be just to eat, procreate and to preserve oneself. What is through our own experience, the role of a human being, it is to free oneself from this sense of limitation. Nobody can deny this. Nobody likes to feel bound or pressed down or, or restricted we are all seeking a sense of freedom from limitation. And so then what do we do? Try to release ourselves by, of course, having associated um, the eye onto these four koshas. We try to then feed these four koshas to various experiences. Why? Because I think that I am the, one of the four koshas, like the mind or the body. Therefore, if I feed the body, if I you know, feed the mind with experiences, therefore I will get at least a little bit of a relief of that sense of, of that bondage. And then the person then goes to the next shot and then to the next shot and then the next shot and then just keeps on going like that. It means that the only valid role that a human being really has, what Robert was now saying, only valid role, end of the day, is to fulfill that very agenda of releasing oneself from that sense of limitation because our own behavior proves it. All consumerism is in the name of at least temporarily releasing oneself from a sense of limitation. How do we pursue that? And the only way to pursue that is by purifying the mind, first step. Because a mind that is still going out towards eating and procreating and preserving itself, it's simply not having the time to think about the subtleties of life. It's thinking about the gross objects of life, skin level deep. Now, how do we purify the mind? There's an attitude change. And what is the attitude change? It is from me-centered into others-centered. And when I say other center, I'm not mean, I don't mean now become, you know, submissive. That is, you know, let people just walk over me like a carpet and I'm just going to be compassionate. I mean, as in the focus changes from this little person, me, 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 into what can I give? What little do I have that I can contribute to this society? Because every person comes infused, given a talent or a certain uniqueness that you find easy and yet others just find hard or inconvenient. And it is everyone's duty in the name of purifying one's own mind to deliver that 
skill or that uniqueness to the world because that is the very sadhana the very practice that purifies this mind so this means the person also has a duty to purify the mind how by contributing to the world so this means there's a spirit of contribution so only when the spirit of contribution comes into one's life then the person is able to fully and, and, and gradually cultivate their mind from this me needy little person into what can I give? Because what is this? What is what's the implications of this? It means that I am already full, or at least it's a starting point of thinking that I am full. And therefore, from that place, I'm able to deliver. But if I'm constantly seeking, what can you give me? Does that not reinforce the same old notion that I am small, I'm empty? Yes. So this means when you have to reverse that cycle. So the hardest thing in this world is to change from me centeredness into other centers. In other words, where is my small sphere of contribution, my small sphere of influence? It doesn't have to be big because we often think our goal has to be grandiose, change the world, save the you know ocean, save the forest. That's fine. But end of the day, when a person starts to, you know, when they start to mature up, what happens? They start to see, actually, that's not really possible because I'm just one small individual. And how to make the best use of that small individual? You need to be very specific. Where specifically do I shine? Where specifically do I sing my tune? Where specifically is my melody heard? And those places, it's what we call your sphere of influence. If we all come from the unmanifest, which is all powerful, all knowing, with all desires being fulfilled, then why are we existing to fulfill desires, which is full to begin with anyway? So it, it kind of contradicts that old statement that we start with a full, and then we exist to kind of full, uh, to fulfill something that's already full to start with. So that's one. And the second related question is, if we do exist to fulfill our desires, then is moksha the fulfillment of all desires? See, the fulfillment of desires will never end because the person never actually looks into the needy subject. In other words, the world becomes about objects and the object is a means to fulfill the subject. But the person hasn't yet looked into the very nature of the subject. So it's only when the person discovers that the subject I is already full, not lacking anything, only then the constant need for the fulfillment of desires drops or simply or not, not that it drops completely because remember what I talked about Ganesha, the rat's still there. But in other words, the person is able to manage or direct their desires in the way that they uh, can deliver to the world. Because even to shine in this world is still acting out your desire. Right. So this means the person simply um, is redirecting their focus from objects onto the subject, which is already full, whole and complete. How can limitlessness, which is full, whole and complete, have a desire to create many, to manifest itself? Atabahusyam. Let's talk about Atabahusyam. Starting point of creation. Let me become many. The creation is the result of Ishwara's desires. Now, what do you mean Ishwara's desires? What it really means is creation is the result of the collective desires of all jivas. So in other words, what does it mean to say um, he created many? It means that Ishwara's desire is entirely for the sake of the jiva's desire. In other words, Ishwara's desire to create the universe is entirely in the name of or for the sake of fulfilling the jiva's desires. In other words, Ishwara sees that the jiva has desire. In fact, that all jivas have desires. And for that reason, he creates the universe. So it's solely on the basis of fulfilling the needs of others and not for the sake of my own need to give a creation. So this means Ishwara's desire is not based on self-centeredness. It's not based on partiality. It's not a personal agenda. It is not based on unfairness. It is not based on raga dvesha, like and dislike. It's not like Ishwara is going, you know, I want some kids. I'm going to give billions, I'm going to give birth to billions of kids throughout this universe. I'm going to populate the universe with kids and I'm going to make them ignorant and I'm going to watch them suffer. No, Ishwara is simply facilitating the collective desires of the entire universe, all of the jivas. 
and on the basis of that gives this creation so that the jiva can play out his or her desires. Now, who are these others that Ishwara creates for? Because I said Ishwara creates for others. Now, who are these others? The others are jivas who think they're others. But from the aspect of Ishwara, there is no such thing as others. So in other words, Ishwara cannot avoid the others, has to account for the others who want a desire fulfilled. That's why we say, what is Ishwara? Jagat Karanam, the creator of the world. But it's also a karma paladata, the one that gives the fruits of actions. In other words, I'm giving the fruits of actions to the jiva, but I'm also giving them the world so that they can express and enjoy their fruits of actions. So let's put this another way. Ishwara sympathizes with the desires of the jivas, all jivas in the universe. Just like a parent sympathizes with the childish demands of the child. Right? I was just thinking that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, I remember I was uh, one of my best friends. Um, I, they had the two little beautiful boys, and they always like to carry a branch over to the house, like a like find a big log from a tree, and just like carry one kilometer walk into the house. And the parents saying like, you know, so many other branches. You're holding onto this branch so like so close. You don't want to let it go. What about all these other branches? No, to this kid, this branch is the entire world. And so the parent then lets this branch be carried over to the house, even though the parent knows end of the day, there's not much in this desire because the kid's going to let this branch go and is going to forget about this branch as if nothing ever happened. So this means the parent, it's not like the parent created this, made this world, this little space or environment available out of their own desire. The parent simply created the cot the environment, the playground for the kid because it is what the kid wanted. Therefore, it's, it's not a selfish desire from the parent. It is simply sympathizing with the needy child who is yet to discover that there is not much in carrying a branch from this place A to place B. However, it doesn't exclude the fact that by allowing the child to fulfill their desires, as much as you know that it, there's not much essence in it, what happens? You're still letting the child for him or for herself discover that for himself or for herself. It's one thing to say it, but another thing to let them discover it for themselves. And therefore you let them have it their way anyway, because that's going to mature them. And therefore they're not going to be dragging a branch from place A to place B. So therefore you're creating this world space for your children so that your children can evolve. But your children still have an option. They can still continue to carry on branches for a long time. But you, 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 cannot, you cannot deny them the world because you also have to take care of other children. So in other words, you create one big world and you let your children and you populate this world with your children so they can carry branches from point A to point B and eventually realize there's not much purpose in doing so. Let me change my perspective. Let me look for something else. And slowly through generations and lifetimes and lifetimes, the person starts to find their way through this massive world of, uh, of options, of probabilities. And they come to that specific point of recognizing the highest purpose of being born. And that is to drop the need to carry branches. Exhausting the desires. Exhausting the desires, right? Those, those needy I need. Remember, it's important to understand to the child, that branch is a world. It doesn't matter if you tell them, drop it. You're going to drop it anyway. I guarantee you, let me show you the proof how others have dropped it before you. The child's still going to carry the branch. Even if you provide him the proof, it doesn't matter, right? In the Vedas, there are two sections. There's the Upanishad section and there's the Karmakanda section. So the question now is, what is the Karmakanda section for? It is for rituals. So just like that, just like the jiva needs certain desires fulfilled, we give them a karma kanda section. In Western um, equivalent, kind of equivalent, would be the law of attraction or the secret. Uh, let me show you a formula, a ritual, which you can perform and then get your desires fulfilled. In that same way, the karma kanda section is there for the demanding jiva. Now, I'm not bringing down karma kanda because karma kanda is highly sophisticated and huge volume of you know wonderful minds that uh, wrote this section but i'm just showing you how there is um, the vedas are 
are, are accounting for both the demanding jiva and once the demanding jiva has exhausted all of their options and they saw okay no matter what i get i the eye is still unsatisfied then they go into the upanishad section the jnana kanda section of the vedas so in reality if you think about it why would a person whose nature is brahman fullness why would they need to do anything to complete themselves if they're already that right now see you can only ask this question from the point of understanding but to that person it's not that it's not like that it's a branch and i need that ritual so therefore i'm not ready yet to listen to the upanishad section so you then give them a karmakanda section so why do we have rituals prescribed for people because the ignorant person jiva thinks i am an individual separate from the world and an individual that is separate from the world cannot be the world which means i am limited but what is my inherent knowledge i am limitless i am boundless and your behavior proves it that's why we're all looking for more implying that i'm not settling for what i have implying that i already inherently know that my nature is boundless so the individual then starts to seek um, uh, wants to complete oneself how by fulfilling desires because one more desire maybe i will be free from this sense of limitation maybe again rituals what do they do just like carrying the branch from true story by the way from place a to place b rituals also qualify the mind slowly as um, martin was saying um, to uh, recognize the the purpose is not really what I'm seeking. There is much more to what I'm really seeking. Therefore, the person goes from Karma Kanda into Upanishad. So this is a natural evolution. So what am I showing you here? If you look at the rituals that are going on, there is, again, no space to degrade them. No space to say, oh, you know, you're doing this Japa, you're doing this Puja, you know, you're so, you're so this and that. No, because to that person, it's like the branch. It matters to them a lot. And that is the very process that's going to get them to a much more mature stage. So we all go through the same process. Andre, I'm a little confused um, in the sense that if creation is uh, because of desires of jivas and creation was always there, uh, I mean, a different cycle every time, but always there, then jiva, doesn't it sort of imply that jivas were always there? And if jivas were always there, then how is it Advaita in the sense, then how do we resolve this separate, you know, two yeah. different beings? They all dissolve into, uh, into the one being. It's like a dream, right? You know, you've got many, many characters. And one of those characters in the dream sees, okay, this is a dream. And when they recognize this is a dream, then they just have no need to come back into the dream. Right, because you see the nature of the dream. Suppose now you're in a dream, right? And you go, okay, so the actual, I thought this dream, I thought I needed this dream. I thought I needed objects in this dream. So this, for this reason, it kept me alive. It kept me going. But now when you start to recognize, well, actually the, the content of this dream is my own content. The intelligence of this dream is actually my own intelligence from the standpoint of the whole. So this means the relationship to that dream changes. And from that standpoint, you still continue as a character in the dream because, you know, you're still alive, you're still breathing. But now upon death, because you've reduced this, this need, you've eliminated this need to kind of participate in the world, thinking that the world can give you something. So now wh where is the logic of coming back and having another, another creation, another dream? Right, because you, you've, you've destroyed the notion that I need this world to fill me up. So this notion, once destroyed, then the body continues, absolutely. But upon death, called Videha Mukti, then there is no coming back. Because what are you to gain, right? Where is the sense of coming to a world and, and you're like, well, you know, this world is myself. Where is the sense of that? So one can only get reborn into this world thinking that this world can give me something. That's why this world is a field of desires. A field whereby we come and then we express our desires. Implying what? There is something in it for me. For me, for who? The individual who is not that. Therefore, I need that to fill me up. So in, in other words, once the knowledge takes place, then 
the person doesn't get born again into this manifest that continues even even when the the enlightened being is no more born in other words the world continues just as it always has but the critical person doesn't find herself in another subtle body conditioned by the four koshas by the five koshas uh, this would be limited to this particular creation or it's going to be sort of like a permanent thing going across different creations i mean different cycles yeah this, so this is in other words all creations in other words no creation will ever i be reborn again in other words creation is of its own accord it's got its own trajectory because you still need to in, in other words your power maya still keeps on creating the world for other jivas right you still got other jivas to enlighten but the being the, the the liberated being no more is born into that world because they sorted out the problem the beginningless pro problem so in a way there would be some jivas who would not get moksha because it's their desires which are going to sort of manifest the next creation exactly the world continues for the rest of those jivas but it doesn't continue for you the one that has solved the problem the desireless being that is uh, basically um, liberated, what happens to that desire, you know, the do desireless being, that essence of that being, do they, they're just full awareness? They're just awareness. When, when, uh, when the a liberated jiva, when liberated the jiva. When the body dies or while alive? Yeah, when the body di dies on completion and you're, you've, um, if desire, all your desires are, are dissolved. Yeah. Um, so it's not like being asleep and feeling nothing at all. No, no, no. In other words, I am at one with myself, which is with limitless, everything. Nature, limitless yeah. nature, aware of myself as myself, as existence, awareness, limitlessness. Nothing mm -hmm. is missing. I just thought that moksha is an innate human desire. It's it's a desire that every jiva has. Yeah. So, and if there are going to be some jivas who are not going to get moksha, that sort of also implies that they were always uh, those jivas, always there in the previous creation and the previous. Yes. You know, and the one before that as well. Yes. So yes. again, coming back to the original question, then how? then they were always these two sort of creatures, one uh, Brahman and one the other ignorant jivas. So they were not the same. Um, they are the same, you know, just, okay. I mean, again, I want to go back to the dream example. So, you know, the one manifests the many and the many do not know who they are, right? So in other words, one of them has to then discover what is my real nature? What is the truth of myself? And the truth of myself is the truth of this entire world. That is all you need to do. Yeah, but someone else hasn't done that. So for them, the world is still real. The world is still worthy of pursuit. Therefore, upon death, what am I going to get? Exactly what I want. And that is a world because the world is my savior. But could you actually live in a state of deep compassion where you've exhausted all your desires in, in a worldly sense? but you're still feeling that sense of compassion for the whole world and come back in a situation and, and, and re-manifest in a, in a position to be able to express that, that compassion for the people around you. Um, that's called an avatar uh, for a specific purpose. Um, however, I mean, I don't know how that works, actually. You know, how does it now a Jeevan... Maybe it's possible, right? A Jeevan Mukta who is liberated and it comes specifically for the sake of compassion and educating the beings. Maybe that's possible. So why is there creation? There is creation because of desires, desi the collective desires of the Jeevas. Why are there desires? Because of ignorance. In other words, I don't know that I'm the whole. Therefore, I have desires to become the whole. How? By having candy, by becoming someone in this uh, world, by being at this, that. Um, so in other words, I'm going to have desires in the hope to uh, release myself from the sense of limitation. Why is there ignorance? Again, you've hit a question with a logical problem. Because this implies that the jiva 
at some point was given ignorance, was given ignorance at a point in time by someone. And therefore, then you ask, okay, then why was a Jiva given ignorance at a point in time by someone? Was that someone uh, bored and they wanted to make the Jiva suffer and enjoy that process? In other words, you cannot ask this question, why is there ignorance? Because ignorance is beginningless. In other words, no one here created ignorance. The, you, you cannot blame anyone for ignorance. You cannot even blame Ishwara for ignorance. Because I just said, it is beginningless. So in short, ignorance gives birth to the notion of a jiva, individual. Individual, therefore, desires. Desires, therefore, creation. In short, what is the purpose of this cycle of creation? Exhaust the karmas. Going one step more, we call ignorance maya. And Maya is a is an expression of the limitless. If I can, I will. You know, I I I can do anything I want. I'm limitless. Part of that limitless is that I'm going to play around with this idea of I don't know anything. I'm ignorant. So this is going in line with the answer that I gave you last week, right? What I say last week: no possibility is not possible because it is Correct. limitless. Yeah. yeah. What I gave you now is a another answer from the Upanishads, a more of a line, more in line with the Upanishads. Last week, I opened up a possibility. It's not really an answer that I gave you last week, even though it is a satisfactory answer one way or the other, but I gave you a proper answer now in this session. So do you think maybe separateness cause will help ignorance along? The idea that we're separate from everything, we're limited, creates yeah. desire because you see other people have things and well, they appear to have things and you think that might make you happier. And it confirms your separateness and then reinforces Yeah, the separateness. It. Yeah, and then reinforces Perpetuates that ignorance. Yeah, so now the question is, what came first? Was it uh, me seeing someone have something, therefore confirming my ignorance? Or did I come with ignorance in the first place, therefore I wanted that object because I thought that I didn't have it already? Right. So that now... person looks happier and yeah. you think they're happier, but you don't know because it's yeah. your consciousness. You don't know. You can't well, know someone else's consciousness, you know what I mean? You, you only know your own. Exactly. So what I'm showing is now which came first? Was it first uh, ignorance that came? Or was it the notion of a jiva? Or was it the notion of a desire? Or was it the notion of creation? It's all at once because it is beginningless. You have referred sometimes to the law of conservation of matter and energy. And you said nothing can be destroyed in this universe, yeah? You just told us that ignorance is beginningless. It's beginningless, ignorance? Beginningless, yeah, ignorance. Ignorance is opposed to knowledge, yeah? Yeah. So when we have knowledge, so ignorance exists, so it's opposed to knowledge, but once we gain knowledge, ignorance no longer exists. Where does it go? Good. In other words, so, yes, so every object in this universe can be, is beginningless, just like ignorance. But the only thing that can be destroyed that has an ending is ignorance. Everything else cannot be destroyed because it changes form. So ignorance alone has an ending. Because as you said yourself, ignorance, what opposes ignorance? Knowledge. This means why am I ignorant? Because I do not know yet the truth of myself. So once I discover that, then I take care of this beginningless problem. So it's kind of interesting if you think about it. We've had so many cycles of creation that we've lived on this world for trillions of years, and not once did we pursue moksha. And therefore, the person gets born again. So let's so is see. Is this lifetime different? Because uh, so we're talking like this. Does it mean this lifetime must be different well, it's, it's to good, all the others? Well, it's a good question. In other words, whoever is alive, even the swamis, whoever is alive, implies what? They too were born over and over and over again so once you come to this knowledge that is very likely that that is your last lifetime ha assuming you have understood the full comprehension of what it means that i am the limitless whole because it's one thing to say but one thing to really integrate it through which comes through time which is normal right so this means it lets you really see how rare this is um what is hiranyagarbha so um we are now we've talked about mahat um let me become many, Atabahusyam. So 
I answered, um, how is it that, you know, the limitless one becomes the many? And I answered that because, you know, out of sympathizing for the desires of the jivas. Now, ahamkara or the hiranya garbha. Did you ever have that time when you had a bright idea? And it was, it was like an insight, like an amazing insight. And you wanted to verbalize it. And it just lost its glow. Did you ever have that experience? So wow in the head, it's like so bright. It's like glowing. It's like resplendent. And the moment you want to verbalize it, you're almost like disappointed. Oh my God, it's like nothing like I actually, you know, had in my, in my mind, in my wear, in my subtle body. If you raise in the class. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, okay. So what is Hiranya Garba? Um, uh, garbha means womb. In other words, the seed or the cause. Hiranya means golden. In other words, that which is resplendent or shining. So Hiranya Garbha means um, the shining, resplendent form of the universe in a thought form. That means all knowledge before gross manifestation. Just like you have a, this amazing bright thought in your mind, right? And then the moment it comes out, what happens? It becomes gross. So it goes from subtle state into gross state. For example, where was the thought of AC current before Nikola Tesla actually thought of it? Tapping into the vast field, that knowledge of AC current comes through Nikola Tesla's subtle body. In other words, it gets transferred from Hiranya Garba, the totality of all subtle bodies into one single subtle body. And therefore the person creates this invention called AC current or DC current or you know the, the light bulb or something. The universe has three stages. The universe from the standpoint of the causal is called Ishwara. The universe from the standpoint of subtle is called Hiranya Garbha. And the universe from the standpoint of the physical, that is the gross, which we are experiencing now, is called Virat. So what is Hiranya Garbha? The sum total of all subtle bodies throughout the universe. In other words, no knowledge is missing. So all of the subtle bodies are part of this Hiranya Garbha. So universe in a subtle state, the entire universe of name and forms and all knowledge, uh, that is that subtle state is called Hiranya Garbha. That means the thought before the universe comes, but also a thought that is always manifesting in a form of this, you know, this physical universe. In other words, a Sarvadnya is Hiranya Garbha, the subtle body of the entire universe. So Lorena asked, what's the proof behind the Big Bang. Now, I'll give you two. The first is the universe is undergoing through a process of expansion. In other words, the galaxies are, uh, the galaxies that are other than the Milky Way, the one that we're in, they are receding away from the Milky Way. That's number one. Number two, the universe is undergoing a process of cooling. So number one, it is expanding, but also it is cooling. Now, both of these suggest what? that at some point in time, the universe was smaller, but also hotter. Now we know that just like an atomic bomb, there's a huge massive amount of release of energy, very hot, but also very big. Now through the course of time, what happens? Not only does that heat start to reduce, but also the size of that entire release of energy starts to uh, reduce. So in that same way, the fact that the universe is expanding, but also cooling, implies by the law of physics that at some point it was much hotter, which implies what? An creation of this massive universe, but also it was much smaller. The second uh, proof of the Big Bang is what we call the Olbers paradox, suggests that the universe didn't always exist. The universe cannot be eternally existent. The universe cannot be eternally huge. How? If you go outside right now, if it's dark, and you look up into the night sky, if the universe was eternally, uh, eternally existent, right, or eternally huge, then what would you see? You would see one massive sky of stars. Why? Because all of those lights would have time to travel from different stars, no matter how far they are, and therefore reach your eyes. Do you understand this logic? Because light travels, right? If the universe was eternally existent, then if you look up into the bright sky, into the night sky, then you would see just one enormous sky of stars with equal intensity. 
but that is not our experience. Our experience is there's just faint. In other words, light is still traveling, implying what? The universe was not eternally existent. It did not, uh, it was not, it began at some point. Now I want to also show you um, this process of the Big Bang and um, a little bit of a chart, interesting, some colors. The Big Bang, 13.8 billion years. From the standpoint of science, what they say is that the, the first singularity, that means from that sudden expansion, they call it the singularity, there was the one grand unified force. And this force further had four sub forces. And the first force that came from this Big Bang, which was gravity. This is why I keep on saying gravity often in Vedanta, because it is the primary force, the first uh, force that came. After came the electromagnetism, uh, and then also the strong and weak nuclear force. The strong force, as we can see here, is responsible for how particles in the universe interact. For example, how to like nitrogen and helium particles are to interact, but also the weak nuclear force is how those particles will decay through the course of time. And this all happened at what time? 10 to the negative 43. So this is, if you think of one trillionth, this is about one trillionth plus add another about 20 zeros, I think. And then right after, now this is one trillionth of a second. So one trillionth of a second of the Big Bang. The next uh, is the electron, photon, gluon, and quark, which I described in that other chart. That's one trillionth. And then the one millionth of a second is a neutron and proton. So this is one, basically one trillionth of the first second of the Big Bang as um, postulated through science uh, instrumentation. Okay, and then uh, we've got 300,000 years later, we've got hydrogen and helium. In other words, before the first 300,000 years, you, would ju you just had space without any particles in it. Now, if you go to outer space, you say, oh, it's empty. It's not empty. As I said earlier, it's still got hydrogen and, and, and helium. And then you've got uh, 4.6 billion years, our solar system. And finally, 4.3 billion years, we're getting, and you're over here with a smiley face, listening to this Vedanta. Okay, now, who wants to volunteer? Let's take a little person, and we're going to bring him into the scale of an ape. Who wants to be an African ape? Hands up. <laughs> okay, so she's, you know, hanging on the vines, looking for some fruits and um, shelter or something, climbing the trees and, you know, making some fire. Not fire yet. Maybe the fire came later. There it is. Now she's making fire. So we, we have Gokhnur here 7 million years ago. That's the first signs of um, something that resembles the human. And then long story short, you know, you keep on going. And now here you're studying Vedanta. Verse 6. dukham sangatash chetanadratihi etat kshetram samasena. Savikaram udahritam. So one of the modifications um, of Kshetram that we're talking about now, that means the manifest universe, uh, from the standpoint of the human being. So where are we now? Remember when I came to this section and then there is a human being. See a human being in the middle? So now verse 6 is talking about the human being. So what are some Kshetram modifications in the human being? And it says here, desire aversion this is what we all go through pleasure pain cognition that means to cognize something and fortitude and all of this is kshetra which is a start which is stated briefly along with its modifications so uh, let's talk about this verse 6 elaborates what are some modifications within the antakarana antakarana means mind in reference to the jiva the first is Chetana. Chetana means the mind is capable. What mind? Your mind, the mind that's always being used. The mind is capable of reflecting Kshetranya, the knower, consciousness. Therefore, because it's capable of reflecting original consciousness called Kshetranya, it thus appears seemingly sentient. And this seemingly sentient presence is called Chetana. For example, I need a light bulb. Okay, I have a light bulb here. If electricity passes through a rock, what happens? 
well, nothing. You know, a rock continues being a rock. But what about through this filament? If electricity passes through this filament, bulb, then this filament lights up. And it glows. And it appears sentient. Why? Because the electricity is flowing through it. So similarly, the gross body, that is the Anamaya Kosha, this is the Anamaya Kosha now, the, the actual shell, is like a light bulb. And the mind is like the filament inside. So in other words, you need the shell for the mind to work. If, you, if I take out this shell, right, and you send electricity to the filament, it doesn't light up. In other words, the mind needs an appropriate instrument in order to reflect original Kshetradnya. So this means the conditions need to be right. If I take out the vacuum from this light bulb, then it still doesn't light up. So this means so many conditions have to come right so that this mind can reflect the original consciousness and therefore appear to this person, to this person, sentient. That's why we say, oh, I'm sentient. Why are we saying that? Because this mind is reflecting the original consciousness, Kshetranya. So whatever sentiency you enjoy, that is being borrowed from Kshetranya. Another example is if you take a mirror, right? A mirror, what, what does a mirror do? It reflects the sunlight. But does the mirror have its own luminosity? No. In other words, the mirror borrows the luminosity, the shine from the original sun's reflection. In that same way, Kshetra Dnya is like the sun. Original consciousness, it's a metaphor. It's like the sun. And the mind is like the, um, like the mirror because it's capable of reflecting the original sun. Of course, if the mirror is tainted or filtered with some uh, specks, it's going to also reflect that. Onto whom? Onto yourself as a being. And therefore, you're going to say, oh, you know, I've got, I've got stuff in my life to work on. Why? Because your mind is resolving, is reflecting the conditions of the mind by the help of the Kshetranya. So the Kshetranya is like the sun. The mind is like the mirror. And the borrowed Kshetranya is like the reflected sun. Do you see this analogy? Okay, so take the sun, just an analogy. Sun is like the original light, always shining. That's called Kshetranya. Shining onto what? The mirror. The mirror is called the subtle body, the mind. And the reflection on the mirror is called reflected Kshetranya. And this reflected Kshetranya in Sanskrit is a very common name. It's called Chidabhasa. It actually just means Chit. Abhasa, chit means consciousness, abhasa literally means reflection. If you put it together, it's chidabhasa. Another name is pratibimba chaitanya. Both mean reflected consciousness. So what is reflected consciousness? When original consciousness is shining onto a reflecting medium called the mind, therefore reflecting its contents. And therefore the person then says, oh, I am this and this. In other words, I am this person, according to these notions in this mind, which is reflecting the original consciousness. The reflecting medium, which is the mind, is Kshetram. But the reflected consciousness, Chidabhasa, is also Kshetram. The original light, the original Kshetranya, is Kshetranya. So the reflection is Kshetram, but so is the reflecting media in the Kshetram. So what do we do then? We confuse the original consciousness with the reflection. Therefore we say, I am tall, I am happy, I am, etc. That's called all reflection. But the fact that there is knowledge about that I am happy, I am so and so, that's because of the original Kshetranya, illumining this mind, illumining the contents and the personality of this mind. Then it says, what are some modifications of this seemingly sentient mind, Chetana? And the first one is Icha Dvesha, attractions and repulsions. This is something that we all have and we all understand attraction, to be attracted to something and to be repulsed by something else. What I'm attracted to, I want. What I'm repulsed by, I do everything so that I can avoid it because who wants pain in their life? Therefore, I avoid what I think is not worthy of my, uh, of my time. In fact, because of this Icha Dvesha, 
is why we categorize the world into worthy and unworthy. This is worthy to me and this is unworthy to me. Even if it's in my highest good, if I have a repulsion towards it, it is still not worthy of my time. Therefore, what do we do? We categorize the world according to what is, quote, good and what is bad. Shallowness, black or white. It's like this or it's like that. In other words, what happens? Because of this modification called Ichadvesha, the objective Ishwara world gets seen through the eyes of the subjective Jiva world, through the subjective eyes of repulsions and attractions, likes and dislikes. So even if you are a divine, a saint, if you remind me of someone in my childhood that, was, uh, that hurt me, what, does, what do I do then? That is a repulsion. Therefore, I then put that repulsion over your face. And therefore, you, be, you are now a repulsive being to me. Why? Because of this association from the past. So this is how Icha Dvesha rules the behavior of the Jiva. And then what does a Jiva do because of this uh, Icha and Dvesha? Adjusts the environment, starts to modify the environment so that it suits its attractions and repulsions. In other words, the Jiva sets up the world so that it accommodates its subjective Jiva Sashti world because of Icha Dvesha, attractions and repulsions. And what's the byproduct of this? What's the result of this attach attachment? Because you've taken so much time and energy and effort to take those things that are unworthy and bring those things that are worthy, that now there's an investment into that. And therefore, I become attached because of my involvement into it. And then what, um, what experiences do these likes and dislikes, this Icha Dvesha produce for the Jiva? The answer is Sukham Dukham, mixture of satisfaction and disappointment. Two reasons, because firstly, neither sukam nor dukam intrinsically belong to any object. Any object has no power to give you happiness or suffering. No object does, but it actually does. Why? Because the mind has classified it as worthy or unworthy, valuable or unvaluable, favorable or unfavorable. Therefore, what do I do then? Once the object becomes favorable to me, I treat it as though it is a god idol. Literally, it becomes my god idol. How? I spend my time, energy, and effort worshiping it, devoting my time to it. And this act of associating value, this strong attachment, is what we call a binding desire. A binding desire is now holding me hostage to be in the presence of this object and to maintain its status for my own well-being because I've associated to be so favorable that I've lost in touch with myself. Therefore, now this object becomes my life savior. This is all how the jiva uh, goes through the process once given the Icha Dvesha Sukham Dukham and starts to make these associations. The second reason is because every object inherently changes. Therefore, from one moment to the next, it no longer holds that fascinating power that it once had just a moment ago and that produces disappointment in other words the jiva as a result goes through a series of satisfactions and disappointments like that so summary is um, uh, the mind overlays its its uh, likes and dislikes onto the world and therefore consequently the world then bestows power to give you happiness and suffering the world was neutral all along. Who gave it the power to make us happy and dissatisfied? We did. How? By our associations. How do we create associations? By assigning what is worthy and unworthy. Therefore, now the world is nothing but a place of favorable and unfavorable things. I discard you, I, I, I get you into my life. In other words, I start to select, be very selective in life. And that binds me, not even recognizing it. And then finally, drtihi. Drtihi is, it says here, fortitude. I will say it is willpower. So now the jiva uses one's willpower to acquire yoga kshema, acquire or maintain those uh, pleasant objects in their life. In other words, now they use another power called free will. And now let me sustain the presence of this object, which I am 
bound by through my own efforts. In other words, who's holding down the jiva? The jiva is holding him or herself down. No one else in this world has the power to hold you down except you yourself. Conclusion, finally, these are the samvikaras or modifications born in the mind of the jiva. So what have we now spoken about? We've spoken about the uh, one of these beings, the jiva, being endowed with these qualities of um, uh, uh, desire, uh, likes and dislikes, attachment, uh, happiness and suffering, and how these modifications affect the life of the jiva. So we've taken a little tour. Okay, and we can close. Any comments? I can maybe put down for the next. So seeing this behavior, seeing this pattern, after a while you can break the pattern because you realize these objects aren't fulfilling you and making you feel happier. You realize that they're changing and disintegrating and decaying. Um, Absolutely. You know, dissolving. And then, and then you realize that external objects don't make you happy. And then, then you can break that that sort of pattern indeed uh, um, Lorena and that takes some time for, it depends on the maturity of the mind some minds take much longer some minds can really figure it out really quickly um, so it really well, through suffering through suffering as well you can have like suffering, a huge absolutely huge amount of suffering and then that can sort of jolt that way of thinking yeah exactly um, and you know if someone asks um, why is there you know in the, in the Vedas we speak about the 14 lokas and um, earth is the only place where there is a mixture of sukham and dukkham. Now, uh, it's actually one of the favorite places because if you don't have suffering, now suppose you're in heaven and just enjoy yourself, svargaloka, you're not going to be thinking about much more than just, you know, like re dissolving yourself in that vast bliss of, of heavenhood. You're not going to be thinking about, you know, what's the nature, who's the one that's enjoying this, right? You're not going to be asking questions like that. So this means suffering is an incredible, potent uh, uh, tool for advancing and speeding up our progress into, into self-growth. Yeah, so this is why it's a great place. Earth is a great place, actually, to be alive. Yeah. yeah. However, through our behavior, we turn what? We turn Earth, which is supposed to be a means, into an end. In other words, we convert what? Various things in this world as the ultimate end like um, going to, you know, just, just, you know, pursuing things in life. Food becomes the end. And you start, you know, talking about uh, food and it's like, oh, let's get, let's together uh, group sessions of food, group sessions of this, group sessions of that. Whereas in fact, this world is just a means for the end. And that is moksha. Yeah. So this is how we trick ourselves. The earth was given the ultimate blessing that a person can receive. But we ourselves converted not into an, a means, but into the end. And therefore, we then spend one lifetime enmeshed in different components, and then we go get reborn again.